Hello guys and welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this video I'm going to be explaining to you guys what it's like to be a PhD student in Canada. Yeehaw! I just need to shut up sometimes. But luckily for you I'm not going to shut up. I'm actually going to talk for the next 8 to 10 minutes. <laughs> about science related stuff and I'm gonna try to like blink more in this video because everybody online always chirps me about the fact that I don't blink they're always like okay so we're having a staring contest like I can't tell that I'm not blinking I don't know but I'm gonna try to incorporate some blinking into this video as well. I'm going to be talking about how to get into a PhD. I'm going to be discussing funding and how you get paid. I'm going to also talk about the workload and the lifestyle of being a PhD student as well as the research and group environment of being in a lab. I'm going to discuss a little bit about teaching, so being a TA, and then I'm going to finish off by discussing how you actually get your PhD. First things first, I just want to set the stage. Being a PhD student is not just putting on a lab coat and mixing some chemicals in a flask. It is much more than that, unfortunately. It's a mix of becoming an independent researcher, becoming an author, becoming a colleague, and a lot of coffee. Emphasize the coffee. You will probably become addicted to coffee. Because as a PhD student, yes, you know, you try to get a lot of work done, but that also involves getting yourself a coffee as a little pat on the back and congratulations every time you complete a few tasks. That's just how we operate. But let's get into my first topic, which is how do you get into a PhD? Getting into a PhD is a little bit different than applying to like medical or dental or law school. At least in Canada, there's no standard test that you need to take to see if you get in. You just need to complete your undergraduate degree in a science related field if you want to do a science related PhD. And the application process is less about getting into the school. It's more about getting accepted by a specific professor. So the first thing you need to do if you want to become a PhD student is find a professor that wants you to join their group. So what you have to do is you have to email professors and make sure that you want to do research in their group. Getting a PhD is not an easy task. It is very hard. 99.9% .9 of my days are hard. So you must love what you do. I know I say this all the time, but I really mean it. So make sure the research that you're going to be doing is interesting to you and that you believe in it. So after you reach out to a professor by email saying, hey, I seen your research group website page. Every research group is going to have a website page. I thought your work was really interesting where you want to emphasize a specific aspect or result of one of their more recent publications and ask them if they would be open to having an interview with you and if you could potentially join their group as a grad student. After you have a formal-ish type interview with the professor, if they like you and they have the funding, or you might have your own funding, which is what I'm going to talk about next, then you get to meet the lab group where you usually get on a Zoom call and then talk a little bit about yourself and why you want to join the group and move to the city that you're expected to move to if you get into the PhD program. And the point of meeting the group is just to gauge if your personality is going to be a good fit for that specific research group. Because if it's not, you might want to consider joining a different group because you have to work with your colleagues. So if none of them like you and you don't like any of them, it's not going to be good. So now, after the professor has accepted you and the group has accepted you, then you usually apply to the school, which ends up usually being the easiest part of this process. So now, what are the options after you decide to actually go ahead and apply to the school? You can either apply to get your master's, which is a two-year program, or your PhD, which would be about a four to five-year program. Or you can start off as a master's student and then transfer into your PhD. That is what I did, because I wanted to make sure that me and the PhD I got along, so the principal investigator, and that I also liked the research group because I didn't want to commit to four to five years of my life, which is a lot of years, before I knew that the research group was a good fit for me. And I also wanted to make sure that I was really passionate about the research because to write a PhD thesis, you need to be invested in what you do. All right, guys, switching gears, I'm going to quickly touch on tuition. So how much does it cost to be a PhD student in Canada? At my school, and I bet these are standard rates, it's about $25 to $2,800 each term. So about seven to $9,000 per year. But this does not mean that you're going to have to pay this whole amount. For example, my school, if you're a PhD student, they give out a scholarship that covers over 80% of the tuition amount for the year. 
and I know a lot of universities also waive the tuition completely. So it depends on the school that you're applying to. But overall, the tuition is not terrible. But at the same time, I think it is really silly that PhD students need to pay tuition because we don't take many classes. At my school, I had to take three classes and then two seminar courses, where the seminar courses are essentially you and all your peers get together and you all have to present your research to a committee, so a few professors at your school, and then you also need to write research proposals. And honestly, as annoying as these classes were, I actually found them quite helpful. All right, switching gears again. Uh, oh, that was so cringy. Okay, let's forget that happened. Let's talk about funding. As a PhD student, you get paid. In Canada, the general stipend amount is about twenty to $30,000 a year. And this is what you're guaranteed to make. And now there's two ways to make this money. Or I guess there's actually three ways that you can make this money. You either TA, your professor either covers the entire amount. And this is if the lab is, you know, really rich. They might just say, here you go, here's your money. You don't need a TA, just show up and do some lab work and I will pay you. And option three, which is a position that I am super grateful to have been in since I started as a grad student, which is where you bring in your own funding through scholarships. And I can do a separate video alone on the Canadian scholarships, but there's the CGSM, which is a master's scholarship, and then the CGSD, which is a PhD scholarship that funds your entire three years. So now if you do get a scholarship, the benefits are that if you decide to still TA, since you bring in your own stipend amount, you get to make money on top of your stipend salary. So you get to make a little bit extra cash. Nothing crazy if you consider the amount of hours that I put in <laughs> during the week. I definitely don't make great money, but it's still good because we get paid to go to school. What's better than that? You get paid to get educated. I think overall that is a win. And then hopefully once we get out, we make, you know, that, that big dollar coin. Additionally, some schools, even my school, for example, Simon Fraser University, there is internal donor awards. So if you get into the school, you can also apply for scholarships within your school to help fund your PhD. Or if you're already getting paid through scholarships or your professor, you get an extra bonus amount to your salary by applying to these scholarships. A lot of the scholarship applications can be a little bit annoying to complete, but at the end of the day, I think it's really, really worth it. And like I said, I will do a separate video on scholarships alone because there's a lot to unpack there. All right, guys, now I'm going to switch gears again, huh, shocker, and talk about the workload of a PhD student and the lifestyle. So the workload is dependent on the professor that you work for, I gotta say. Some profs do not care. They're like, you know, just come in and if you get stuff done, then good job, I'm happy no matter what. Whereas other professors do demand lots of work gets done. There is especially some groups at my school where I'm not gonna name drop, where students are in there for 10 to 12 hours per day doing work, which is crazy. But it's not always like that. So yeah, when you're applying to do your PhD and you get to meet the research group, maybe you should ask that question. How many hours do you guys work per week in the lab? And there you go, you will get your answer because each group is going to have a different standard for the amount that they work. I generally work eight to 10 hours per day, I would say on average, but sometimes I end up working 15, 16 hour days, but then I'll take a few days off. So honestly, it really depends, but I would say that's actually a pro of being in a PhD is you get to pick your own schedule, right? So let's say I wanted to go away for the weekend. I could get a lot of work done from Monday to Thursday and then take Friday to Sunday off. Then it wouldn't matter because we're technically our own bosses in a way. And now just because you work 15 hours doesn't mean you're going to be doing research for that whole 15 hours. You might be doing a literature search. As a PhD student, you unfortunately have to read a lot more than you want to. So some days you're reading and writing on the couch all day long. But then other days, yeah, you actually are quite hands-on getting in the nitty gritty dirty work like a tradesman in the lab. So it depends. I guess that's my answer to a lot of things, which is kind of like when my students ask me chemistry questions. I'm like, huh? <laughs> It depends. A little bit of this and a little bit of that. Let's talk about TAing. So as a grad student, you can either TA labs or tutorials, or you can just be a marking TA. I have done all three types because I want to be a teacher when I grow up. 
So even though I do bring in my own funding, I still decide to TA because, yep, I make a little bit extra cash. And number two, I love teaching. It is my passion and it brings me so much joy. Tutorials usually run one to three times per week where you just have to prep essentially a lecture where you go through questions that relate to the coursework that is being presented in class. Tutorials usually have 20 to 30 students in them, whereas labs, you could be teaching up to 60 students, but there's usually three TAs in the lab section and you guys kind of share the students. TAing a lab is a little bit more hands-off. At the beginning of the lab, you have to tell the students what they're doing and give a brief overview, but the expectations of the students are that they're showing up and they're prepared to actually, you know, do the lab work. So they should know what they're doing and you're just there to kind of assist them with the theory and if anything goes wrong and also mark their lab reports. And then as a marking TA, it's usually upper level courses. Let's say quantum mechanics. I did that once, would not recommend. Where essentially you just mark all the assignments and then the midterms and then maybe the final exam, depending on the professor. All right, guys, that brings me to the final point that I was going to discuss in this specific video. I'm going to make a whole series, don't you worry, but it's the finish line. How do you actually get your PhD? So throughout your PhD, you're essentially going to have to organize all the data that you collect into chapters. And these chapters are stories. These stories hopefully will get published. If not, they still will end up as chapters in your thesis, where you should aim for two to five chapters in general. But once again, each PhD thesis is going to be very, very different. So do not compare what work you're doing to anybody else, because even within your own group, each project is very, very different. So just because you don't have as many chapters as somebody else does not mean that you have it done good work because each project is so different. But essentially you organize all the data that you have collected into chapters and then these chapters make up a thesis where it's broken down into an introduction chapter, then the core body, which is all the work you completed, and then a conclusion and then a future work where the future work will serve for ideas for incoming new graduate students. You usually graduate a PhD within four to six years. I've heard up to seven. I think seven is the maximum in Canada, but if anybody knows for sure, correct me in the comment section. But after you've written up your huge thesis, you essentially just submit it to your committee members and your professor. They edit it. They might tell you to make some revisions, but if they accept you, then you get to present your work, which is like a 20 minute presentation where you can present to your friends and your family, as well as your committee members and your PI and there's usually an external examiner. After your presentation is completed, then they can all ask you a bunch of questions, grill you about the work that you did, as well as the work that's being done in industry and any theory related to your field. If they are satisfied with your presentation, your thesis and the question period, then you become a doctor of philosophy. And that's pretty much a brief summary on how that works. I know I only, you know, dipped my toes in the water into each of these subtopics during this video, but I will make specific videos on each of the things that I talked about today. If you made it this far, please make sure to leave a like, comment, save, or subscribe to my channel. It would be greatly appreciated. I love you guys all so much, and I hope this video was insightful, and I hope you have a great day. Slay! <laughs> Hi!